Hi, have a nice brunch. Uh, on these weekend uh, videos, I try to talk about current events in an historical perspective and uh, the chilling events that are going on in London of the massive riots and the breakout really of class warfare uh, is very scary, particularly for those of us in the United States. And uh, we watch it and we wonder, can that come to our shores? So I thought I'd spend a little bit of time tracing the history of class warfare in the United States. Uh, we were blessed because our Revolutionary War had nothing to do with class warfare. In fact, it was led by rich people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and John Hancock, uh, and included poor people as well. Uh, it was really a national effort, not a class warfare. Uh, then in the 1820s and 1830s, Andrew Jackson took that impetus and really made it increasingly about class uh, by expanding the franchise, universal male white suffrage, uh, and really railing against the Bank of the United States that he said was the center of corporate and industrial power. Uh, then after the Civil War, it kind of got turned on its head. Uh, it became class warfare, but uh, on behalf of the rich. Uh, at that time, the theory was social Darwinism. People had just come to grips with Darwin's theory about evolution, and they said that's survival of the fittest, and that reinforced the sort of Presbyterian idea of predestination. And the whole idea became that if you're successful, you're blessed and you're privileged and God must really like you. There was a huge rebellion against that, starting around 1890, led by the farmers and the citizens in the western part of the United States. Uh, there was a period in which the, there was tremendous deflation uh, because we were on the gold standard and there wasn't enough currency and farmers were really in terrible shape. And that led to the populist rebellion uh, where they insisted on trying to inflate the currency and it also led to a lot of important measures like the income tax, women's suffrage, and and uh, direct election of senators, uh, as well as the referendum in initiative and the recall we just saw in Wisconsin that was adopted about that period. Uh, class warfare, again in the 20s, kind of turned on its head uh, when we began to look at rich people again as favored. But then when the Great Depression hit, there was a tremendous impetus toward class warfare. Now FDR played it in a very interesting way. In his first administration, he had nothing to do with class warfare. He really opposed it. He did everything he could to save the banks, save the capitalist system, and make it work. But then when he saw that he really wasn't going to solve this depression, that he could lower unemployment from 26 when he took office to 13 in 1936, but it was not going any lower, he figured he would campaign for election in 1936 on an explicitly populist class warfare platform. Uh, in a speech in Philadelphia accepting the Democratic nomination, he said, the economic royalists hate me and I welcome their hatred. And he then introduced a whole series of legislation uh, aiming at the upper class and really working on disenfranchising them in the United States. That had the effect of rekindling the Depression and unemployment went back up to 26 and stayed there until World War II took it down. In the remaining 40s and into the 50s and 60s, uh, there really wasn't much in the way of class warfare. Uh, there began to be, on the other hand, a social populism that was sort of the conservative movement's answer to the economic populism of the left. Uh, the economic populist vilified Wall Street, uh, the social populist vilified Hollywood, <laughs> and uh, in a sense it was an attack on values, not just on economics. That was highlighted by the anti-communist efforts in the 1950s, uh, the concerns about school busing and policies like that in the late 60s and the early 70s, uh, and the uh, moral majority, the Nixon uh, focus against flag burners and uh, opposing the Vietnam War protests. Really, the next time the class warfare was really tried in the United States was during Clinton's campaign in 1992. Uh, he realized that he had to appeal to a Democratic Party base and that that was, if he could get 40 or 42 percent of the vote, he'd win because Ross Perot was in the race. And he tried a very explicit, overt kind of attack 
on the George Bush as a yuppie, a preppy, a, uh, a rich inherited guy. Remember when Ann Richards said in her uh, speech at the Democratic Convention, uh, George Bush was born with a silver foot in his mouth. And she said he woke up on, was born on third base and thought he'd hit a triple. All of that stuff was effective in that campaign, but only because the Democrats could win with a relatively small vote share. The fact is that since then, economic populism has been roundly rejected by the American people. It wins the Democratic primary. It becomes something that Democrats can focus on. But in the United States, we have always regarded class in terms totally different from that in Britain. In Britain, the attitude had always been, I'm working class, I'm proud of it, I don't want my son to grow up and be some sort of entrepreneur. I want him to make an honest living as a carpenter or a bricklayer like I do. Uh, and when a boss comes in in his Rolls Royce, uh, the British factory worker says, uh, I hate him because he has a Rolls Royce. Now in the United States, there's such upward mobility that people are always thinking, I want my son to have a Rolls Royce. I want my son or daughter to have a better life than I've had. And the upward mobility that is at the core of the American economic and social political structure has diffused the potential for class warfare. But now we have no upward economic mobility. The only upward mobility that's possible is through political action, uh, when you increase government entitlements and handouts. And that really is a recipe for class warfare. And you have a president who is explicitly stoking class warfare. And uh, that's a very dangerous thing. And when you look at the disruptive effects of that in Europe, it could bring really a poison into our body politic in the United States that until now, thankfully, has been absent. Thank you.